Hello everyone. The Training Cafe is open for business today. It's Monday, it's mid-September. I'm looking forward to uh, cooler weather uh, for the fall climbing season. Um, I guess fall officially arrives when? In the next couple of days, uh, at least astronomically how things are defined. And uh, uh, if you're a uh, American climber traveling to the Red River Gorge, well, then there's a good chance we'll cross paths at some point in October or November, as I plan to spend a few weeks down there, uh, enjoying hopefully some of the best weather of the year. And I hope you are able to uh, get out and uh, enjoy the pleasant autumn conditions for sport climbing, rock climbing, big wall climbing, or bouldering, whatever your preference, or just going for a hike or a run. You know, fall's absolutely my favorite season. And so in this training cafe, um, I really don't have any training agenda. I'm not thinking intensely about training right now because I'm ready to go climbing. And, uh, you know, kind of all the work has been done uh, in past months. Oops, there's my reminder. Not to forget the training cafe is opening at noon. <laughs> so um, in any case, uh, you know, at this point, it's about setting yourself up to win when you get to the crags. Uh, and that means getting there fresh and ready to send and having some uh, compelling goals, you know, to, to get you out there to the boulders and crags and uh, to be really smart in how you invest your, your time and energy when you're there at the crag. No wasted goes. Uh, you know, be really smart about, you know, uh, investing your energy efficiently when you get out to the boulders and crags. Uh, and, you know, trying to avoid things that tempt injury because there can be the strange boulder or route move that is tweaky. You know, for me with uh, older guy shoulders, I, that's what I'm always watching out for is weird uh, shouldery kind of things. Uh, you know, obviously finger issues, issues are, are common. And so, well, I, uh, you know, I, I guess it should be the exception not the rule that you back off routes because you are concerned of injury. That's something that, you know, maybe once or twice a year, I'll get on a route and deem it a little too risky for me because of a, a body position or finger hold, uh, you know, that I say to myself, hey, you know, I um, place a higher value on not getting injured than doing this particular route. I'll go find something else. Uh, and so those are all kinds of things to be thinking about heading into the fall season. And I, one more thing I'll add is I released a podcast a couple of days ago, uh, Training for Climbing podcast. If you go onto Apple Podcasts or, or Spotify or Stitcher or you know any of those uh, podcast players uh, or Google it, Eric Hurst Training for Climbing podcast. But the most recent uh, edition, I go over 13 little big things, you know, send tips that seem small and kind of insignificant, but they can be very impactful uh, on game day. Uh, and so check out that podcast if you haven't already. I think you'll enjoy it and get some really valuable tips, uh, you know, uh, kind of things uh, that I've discovered over my 45 years as a climber, but also things that, you know, scientifically are founded and are used by a lot of pros. And so it's not just my list. It's a list of common things that a lot of climbers do on game day to improve uh, the chance of sending. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that podcast and, uh, you know, be a subscriber to the Training for Climbing podcast. I do about one per month and uh, I try to make them really high value. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different climbing podcasts out there. Many of them very good, very entertaining. Um, you know, some of them are long and conversational um, and uh, they can be entertaining to listen to, but there's, you know, only bits and pieces of actionable information. My podcast, it's for the most part, just me. It's rare that there's interviews. Uh, maybe once a year I do an interview with somebody, but more often than not, it's me kind of as a coach, as a lecturer, sharing a lot of high quality information, a lot of actionable information. And so it can be a very content-rich hour-long podcast if you tune on in. Okay, so uh, today's Training Cafe I'm dedicating to you and your questions, uh, dear listeners. And we've got uh, a couple of dozen people dialing in here already. So if you have a question on uh, 
you know, climbing performance, injury, nutrition, training, anything climbing related, type it into the comments box and I will answer it here on the spot. Now, uh, before I do that, of course, this is the Training Cafe and one thing we do, our ritual for each and every episode is for us to toast to climbing, the spirit of climbing. And so if you've got a cup of something to drink, in my case, it's still coffee, uh, let's raise our glass and climbers around the world unite, commune with coffee. And this is like my fourth cup of the day. I'm a coffee drinker. So um, I am uh, in my uh, home here um, working today. Uh, trained pretty hard the last couple of days. And uh, my forearms are quite stiff and sore. And, you know, I'm older, so I recover more slowly. So I, uh, you know, I'm slamming a lot of protein today. I'll, I'll go out for a run and do some stretching and foam rolling uh, but nothing climbing related after, you know, two days, uh, each with double workouts. So I did four workouts in the last two days. Uh, again, uh, it's not that I'm in a, a program because I'm soon going to be traveling to climb. It's that I'm just trying to stay um, and maintain my peak strength, power, endurance, you know, all three energy systems, trying to keep them up to snuff as I head off on the trip. And, and really, uh, you know, I'm hoping to climb this Friday. And so I'm debating whether I'm going to climb any more between now and then, um, you know, because I have a sense that my nervous system has really fallen behind from, uh, you know, four hard workouts in two days. Um, there's obviously some uh, connective tissue and muscle recovery that needs to be done because you train hard. You not only break down muscle, you break down connective tissue um, and the connective tissue is slower to come back. Uh, and remodel than the muscle is. And so uh, it can take three, four days to come back from a really hard bout of training as I have done the last two days. Uh, so I, I might do a light climbing workout tomorrow, just some uh, volume, low intensity climbing, you know, kind of circulatory to aid the recovery. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's it though. You know, I think I, I, I travel Thursday and then I I get a climbing day on Friday, and so I should be 100% if I, uh, you know, stay with the program, which, uh, you know, for an enthusiastic climber, that can be a problem too, you know, especially if you have a hangboard or a wall at home, as I do, uh, you know, you can be tempted to keep adding on and doing more and more and more, and, you know, then you hinder your recovery or, you, you know, dig a deep hole to recover from, and you end up getting injured, uh, and so those are all things that especially, you know, the veteran coach and the older climber, I am always kind of thinking about. Uh, okay, uh, one more thing, I guess, before we get to uh, the first few questions that have been typed in here. Um, the shout out, the Training Cafe shout out this episode. Uh, Stefano Gustafi did the second ascent of uh, a route called Move Hard at Flat Anger. Now, Move Hard is an Adam Andra link up of two of Adam's routes. Uh, he has the route Move and he has the route Silence and Move Hard, I believe, starts on Move and ends on Silence, uh, skips the hardest crux of Silence, but then comes in above. And Stefano was there, I guess, for much of the last month, um, climbing, beginning to work on Silence. Uh, you know, it's not had a second ascent yet in the, what, four or so years since Adam did it. And uh, uh, Stefano is, uh, or um, I guess one of a short list of people who could have a shot at doing silence. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he's uh, certainly an experienced climber at Flat Anger. And I guess uh, doing Move Hard is a step towards doing silence since it shares some of the climbing. And uh, now I believe he's left for the year, uh, but he's got it set up to uh, continue working on next year. It took Andre a couple of years to do silence. And so um, uh, Stefano perhaps, you know, can put it together next year. Who knows? We shall see. Uh, okay, so we have the uh, Training Cafe toast out of the way and the shout out out of the way and all of my small talk <laughs> out of the way. Let's get to a couple of training questions here. Um, and the first question is, let's see here. Um, a question about doing density hangs as a preparation for starting campus boarding 
what would you recommend for sets and reps and hang duration? And can I do them as a warm up for general sessions? So, um, you know, the term density hangs, uh, you know, I think was popularized in climbing by uh, Dr. Tyler Nelson out of Salt Lake City. Uh, you know, it comes out of the old, uh, you know, book of training for tendinopathy, um, you know, which more commonly, you know, outside of climbing are things you see uh, in the elbows, but uh, very commonly like Achilles tendon, uh, you know, knee. And so doing slow isometric or eccentric uh, exercises, very, very slow, uh, uh, lasting 30, 40 seconds, sometimes longer, uh, have been shown to uh, be ideal for uh, providing the tenocytes, those are the metabolically active cells, uh, the fibroblasts in your connective tissues. So in your tendons and ligaments and the extracellular matrix of your muscles, these are the you know, collagen fibers that uh, transmit the force through your body. And so those slow eccentrics or you know, these density hangs, uh, isometrics, are good for uh, giving that steady, um, sustained loading that gives a signal to the tenocytes on how to um, align the collagen that they slowly extrude uh, in an attempt to heal uh, an injury or strengthen a an uninjured body part. Um, and so, you know, you can do density hangs on a fingerboard or on a pull-up bar, uh, depending which body part you're kind of aiming at. And uh, so it's a good thing to um, give, uh, it, it's, it's a good stimulus to uh, signal the connective tissues to uh, be active, to uh, remodel and get stronger, which is a very, very slow process. It takes, you know, years for connective tissues to, you know, lay down new collagen. And this might be a poor analogy, but think of a tree adding on a ring each year. Uh, it's not exactly what's happening in your tendons and ligaments, but it's kind of the same idea that it's a very slow process to add uh, collagen and to uh, increase the cross-sectional area of uh, tendons and ligaments, which do very slowly hypertrophy given appropriate loading. And so doing that type of training can be good for rehab and it can be good for just overall health. Now, those slow eccentrics, one thing they do is uh, while they signal for generating more collagen, they actually break the cross links between the collagen fibers. So the collagen fibers, you want them to lay down uh, longitudinally along the axis of force. Okay, that's how good healthy tendons and ligaments are structured. But then there is cross bracing. Think about the cross braces in the rafters of your house. Uh, and the cross bracing between the collagen, it, it, there's cross linking just like that. It's enzymatic cross linking in your connective tissues. And when you do those slow eccentrics, you actually, uh, the, the fibers are sliding and you break some of those cross links. And that uh, reduces the stiffness of the tendon. So you have to keep straight stiffness versus strength. They're two different things. Uh, you know, and so uh, for a climber, uh, you want to long-term develop both because a stiffer tendon, stiffer connective tissue muscle tendon system has a higher rate of force development and it has a more efficient transfer of force so that you get more force to the working uh, body part, uh, less loss. Um, and so you get more out of every unit of ATP that is split by increasing the efficiency. So uh, when you campus train, campus training, which is a ballistic exercise where you're you know, shock loading the connective tissues, it's a completely different stimulus from the density hangs. It's actually the other end of the spectrum. The density hangs are slow isometrics that give a signal for laying down more collagen um, and uh, you know, increasing the density hence the name of the connective tissue, but it breaks those cross links. So you actually reduce the stiffness with, ice, with uh, density hangs. 
Campus training, more ballistic quick moves, doing powerful quick pull-ups versus slow heavy weighted pull-ups. Those quick movements don't break the cross-links um, and actually give a stimulus for the body to make more cross-linking, to make the connective tissue stiffer, which is good for performance. So the density hangs, uh, again, are ideal for rehab scenarios, during which you'd wanna do no campus training, obviously, uh, because when you're rehabbing, you generally want to um, give a signal for strengthening, but not a signal for stiffening. But then as you're training for performance or uh, transitioning into a performance block of training, that is when you actually wanna get stiffer. So the, the density hang should be reduced or eliminated from your training, assuming you're healthy and you're heading into a performance period, like this fall season, right now would be the time to do some campus training um, it, assuming you're prepared to do that, not everybody should be campus training, uh, but that's a whole other topic. Uh, but if you are physically able to train uh, on a campus board safely, then those types of fast uh, and ballistic movements on the campus board are what give a signal for stiffening your system, increasing the rate of force development, also faster motor unit recruitment. So there's also a neuromuscular benefit to campus training, but there's definitely a connective tissue benefit to campus training, both of which have the effect of making you more powerful and more efficient uh, when you go to perform. So again, off season uh, or injury, you're doing more of the density hangs, more of the slow, heavy loading, uh, you know, appropriate loading always for the situation you're in. Uh, but then if you're healthy and heading into performance season, you're reducing or eliminating those slow or isometric movements, the density hangs, removing those because they lower stiffness of the system. You're doing more of those fast boulders and pull-ups and campus training, which uh, both uh, train the neuromuscular system and the connective tissues to create force and transmit force more quickly. So there's a really long question, um, but it's uh, a complex topic, but a very powerful topic. For a beginner climber, it's TMI, but for a more advanced climber, you need to understand the very different scenarios here. And if you're doing density hangs as a healthy climber during performance season, you're actually doing the wrong thing. You should be campus training. Uh, again, appropriate amounts. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go here to the next topic or question. Uh, what's your opinion on eccentric overload training for strength building for max pull-ups and finger strength? Any tips on positives and negatives? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, eccentric training is a big thing in the bodybuilder and powerlifting and weightlifting world because, of course, you can lower a heavier load than you can pull, you know, your eccentric strength is 10 or 20% higher than your concentric strength. Um, and so there is a utility to it in strength training, but it's not the main mode of training that a climber should be involved with. Uh, and, and of course, let's not forget that a lot of our climbing uh, positions, especially gripping, is relatively isometric. Uh, you know, you're not, you know, moving your fingers a lot through a large range of motion when you're when you're climbing. Now you might grip holds in different positions, uh, you know that the hold dictates, and so you, there is a necessity to train different grip positions for sure. Um, and just like you know, you lock off on climbs and you hang straight arm on climbs and everything in between. Uh, and so it's important to have a variety of training. And so doing some eccentric training. Let's say you're someone who's training to do your first one arm pull up. Not that that's a necessity in hard climbing, but most hard climbers can do one arm pull ups. Um, you know, my son, Cameron, can do, I think, like 12 or 13 one arm pull ups and just knock him out, you know, but he climbs 515. Uh, now, he got there very slowly, and one of the ways he learned and I first learned to do a one arm pull up was by doing pulling up with two, locking the bar off, and then doing a slow eccentric. And it's a very effective, you know, there's a number of other exercises you can do to train to do a one-arm pull-up, but that would be one of them. And so there's some value there, but it's not 
something you should be doing all the time. It's just like hangboard training. You know, I, we climb with our hands above our head, so I think we should do a lot of our training in that position. But to occasionally do uh, lifting exercises, which is a little more concentric when you're lifting something off the ground with a grip or a pinch, there's some training value there. Even though it's not quite as climbing specific, it could arguably be a good way to mix up your training. So uh, yeah, I think there's some value in all of the above. Uh, it's um, all, all you know, comes down to programming and you know um, novelty. Uh, you know, if you've been training the exact same way for the last three years, you probably should mix it up and add something new in. Uh, you know, that's one of the you know hallmarks of an effective training program. It needs to be progressive. You know, year over year or season over season. It needs to introduce some novelty. And of course, you don't want to waste a lot of time and energy on junk training, things that really have no value for where you're at right now. They might have had value a few years ago, but they might not have value for you anymore. And so, uh, you know, that uh, speaks to the um, importance of constantly evaluating your training program each season, you know, tinkering with it appropriately, hopefully making it more effective. You know, I like the saying that the best training program for you right now is one that you're not doing that you can you know i can look at pro climbers people that climb 515 you know elite climbers and i can help them tweak their program you know i was just helping you know one of the world cup climbers tweak their program for this winter season and take it to the next level even though they were wearing medals this year on the podium at the world cup uh and so you know you you know you have to always be thinking about what you can do to take it to the next level Okay, um, let's see here. What is up next? Uh, best way to keep up or even advance all energy systems when only climbing outdoors on a perpetual road trip. I travel with a tension board, some bands, few weights. Yeah, Dave, I mean, that's, that's a common problem, you know, for people that go on the road for weeks or months on end. Uh, you know, for me, I rarely get on the road for more than, you know, a two to four week trip. But uh, there's no doubt you tend to lose some max strength and power on those trips if you're just climbing a lot, if you're route climbing a lot, uh, as I am, and it sounds like perhaps you are too. Um, having a, a portable board like the flash board by tension is not only a great warm-up tool, but as part of that warm-up, if you do a few of those kind of mid uh, min edge, or even if you have a way to add a little weight on and do a few weighted hangs, uh, as kind of the completion of your warm up, uh, and then you go climb, you know, you can, uh, you know, that, I think that can go a long way to helping you maintain your maximum strength while you're on a road trip. Uh, now, in terms of putting in full fledged training days, that's tough to do if you're actually trying to climb hard, you know, say four days a week. Where are you going to put a training day in? Uh, I suppose if you know you're going to be taking two or three days off to travel from one area to another, so you know you have this extended rest break, which your body might need if you've been climbing hard for many you know, days. Uh, but maybe that last day before you travel and have a two or three day break, maybe that last day is a day you could also do you know, some type of a strength workout on your portable board. Um, and do some other supplemental training, say antagonist muscle training, clued together some tools to do it. And, uh, you know, the, taking the bands along is great for, you know, warming up your rotator cuff. Uh, but it's hard to execute a really comprehensive workout when you're on the road, short of going to a climbing gym and, you know, paying a day rate to go in there. But again, I am hesitant to do that when I'm on a trip because it's like I want to invest those big, you know, climbing energy expenditures on climbing outside, you know, on actual routes. Uh, and so um, a little bit done at the right times, especially integrated into that warm up at the start of your climbing day, I think is, is the best way to go. And, you know, your rest days should be rest days. I mean, they could be active rest and involve hiking or bike riding or, you know, hiking out to the crag and blaying somebody else. But uh, you have to be careful to, you know, not break the rest day and get drawn into more and more climbing uh, because those long road trips can also be where people succumb to injury you know because you're again you're um, if you're climbing a lot and trying to constantly push yourself 
you know, your connective tissues uh, are, you know, breaking down every time you load uh, severely, you know, just like your muscles break down with uh, loading, so do your connective tissues, but they recover more slowly. And so really good nutrition is a big part of a road trip, you know, making sure you're getting 100 plus grams of protein, I think is, uh, is essential. Okay, on we go to uh, Danny uh, from Kalimnos. Wow, lucky you. Uh, been here for two weeks now. Would you recommend any particular maintenance exercise or schedule during a long climbing trip uh, to supplement regular climbing? Um, I, I'll be here for another four to six weeks, then a few more weeks climbing in Turkey. Uh, I have a crane scale, single portable, no edge hang like the lattice board, um, and a pinch block. Wow. Danny, uh, I just kind of covered all that, didn't I? <laughs> so, uh, but lucky you, that's a nice long climbing trip, you know, going from a month in, or more in Klimnos to a few weeks in Turkey. Uh, that's a pretty sweet trip, you know, don't get injured, you know, and uh, again, I would use those tools to get a really good comprehensive warm up. Um, having the crane scales, you know, having some type of a force measuring device is actually quite useful on climbing trips because, uh, very often it's hard to tell how recovered you are after a few weeks on the road you know if you're climbing two days on one day off two days on two days off or you know some schedule like that you're always kind of wondering like you're going up to give a send go to a route you know am i fully recovered after one day off after two days off um and you know it's hard to intuit that you know some days you know, when I'm on road trips, I warm up and I don't feel like I'm 100%, but I climb really well. Uh, and then other days I've taken two days off um, and I, I think I'm fully recovered and I get on the route and I'm not. So it's, it's a tough thing to intuit sometimes. Uh, and that's where, uh, you know, if you go through your morning warm up or your crag warm up and have uh, a force measuring device uh, that you can, you know, do a finger force reading on at the crag, like the Tindig, and you know, there's a number of other devices out there. Uh, you do your whole warm up and do, um, you know, a couple of pulls on your fingers and see what the number is. You know, over time, assuming you you do it regularly, you can kind of see, you know, if you're, um, you know, pulling a 71 day, uh, and that's pretty close to your fresh 100% you know, finger force, but then another day you're at 55, you say, hey, you know, I'm operating at a fraction of my full finger force. Uh, maybe I need another day off, or maybe this isn't the day to try to send my hardest ever project. Uh, and so um, having a way to collect some data, take some measurements on a uh, road trip can be quite helpful and uh, allow you to invest your time more wisely and really make uh, those send goes count. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, he says, uh, my girlfriend and I had a baby nine months ago and we're struggling to get time for climbing and also motivation. Any rec recommendations for the mental and wrapping up routines? Yeah, you know, I, I was there one day and my wife and I had two kids and you know, we, uh, you know, when they were newborns didn't climb as much. Uh, thankfully, we had a, a small home climbing wall at the time and we were able to kind of stay in shape. Uh, and she got back in shape really fast. Uh, and, um, you know, but that first year is a real challenge. Uh, you know, year two, year three, you can throw the kid into the backpack carrier and we would go to the crags and get half days in. And so that kind of motivated us to, to get out, though, you know, the all day at the crag thing didn't happen for a number of years, you know, unless we had a babysitter or dropped him off at a grandparent uh, and were able to do a day or a weekend trip without the newborn. And that might be something you want to try to arrange you know, every now and then, you know, because it's a nice break and it gives you something to, you know, a little trip to look forward to. If you can get away for a day or two, you and your wife to climb without the child. But that first year, it's not going to happen, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, it can be frustrating. And I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, it, it you know, it, the time is going to pass faster than you think. Um, and uh, soon enough, you'll be in that stage with the kid in the backpack carrier going out to the cliff. Um, if you're with another couple or another climber, that's ideal so that you can have a climber, a belayer, and a baby watcher. Uh, and, uh, you know, it takes a little effort 
to get it done, but uh, we did it and I'm sure you can as well. But that first year is challenging. Uh, what I would say you don't want to do is just, you know, give up on climbing for a year and stop your training, you know, and fall out of shape. And, you know, you won't lose your climbing technique and your, all that brain learning, um, you know, all that neuroplasticity that's taken place over your years as a climber. You're going to keep that, but certainly strength wise, you're going to lose your connective tissues will uh, de de degrade slightly. You'll lose some of your connective tissue strength. And so uh, that takes time to come back from. So if you can get on a hangboard a couple days a week, if you have a small bouldering wall, you can at home that you can climb on or a climbing gym nearby that you can go to once or twice a week uh, during this first year, year and a half. Uh, I think that's important to stay active. It's good for stress relief. It's good for a break, you know, from baby stuff. And it will help keep you uh, maybe sane, uh, just, you know, just, you know, throughout the, you know, episodes of chaos that having a small kid around can be. So, but it's all good and enjoy it. Um, okay. Uh, let's see where we're at here. How many different grip positions are optimal within a hangboard session if each grip is done for three sets? Yeah, um, really, it depends. Uh, a, a very advanced climber with a lot of training history, uh, I think you could, you know, do, you know, uh, half crimp, you could do open crimp, you could do drag or open hand, you know, whether it's three finger or two finger or even some one finger pockets if you're ready for that. Um, and pinch. Now, I prefer doing pinch standing. That's one of those exercises I prefer doing standing. Um, you could train the other grip standing and doing lifts as well. Uh, though, you know, a hangboard, I think, is, you know, a proven tool for sure. Um, or you could do a mix of them. Um, if you're doing three sets of a grip position, I would say for many people, you just want to do the three sets at that half crimp. Of course, you never thumb lock when you're training. You might need to do it when you're actually climbing, but uh, it, it just makes the angles and the forces a little too dangerous for training loads, you know, especially weighted training loads. But doing kind of that, um, that half crimp and open hand drag. Uh, and you'll develop enough strength in those two positions to carry over in between positions. Um, as you become more uh, well-trained and uh, are able, uh, then you could add in some you know, open crimping, which is where you have these two fingers crimped, the middle two crimped, and the other two fingers are kind of more open. So it's kind of that halfway in between the drag and the half crimp and pinch. Uh, you know, and the pinching is more about training your thumbs, especially that distal aspect of your thumb. To train pinch properly, make sure that you're only gripping with the uh, last digit of your thumb. If you, if you pinch the object so that your whole thumb is squeezing like that, it's not as an effective way of training as it is if you just have your, um, that last joint because that is the weak link in pinching for most people is the muscle that flexes this last joint of the thumb. It's in your form, but it's uh, what flexes your thumb. And uh, you know, all the other intrinsic muscles in your hand get trained you know, doing different exercises, different pinches and such. So um, yeah, I, I would say for people uh, new to hangboard training, half crimp, an open hand, you know, drag pocket grip, uh, and then you can add in uh, a few more uh, positions, uh, maybe up to four positions. And if you're doing three sets, that's a lot of sets. But again, I'm talking more an elite level climber that is, by the way, just doing a hangboard workout. If you're doing hangboarding as um, an addition, in addition to a bouldering session, let's say, uh, the hangboard needs to be way more brief. You just can't do a long bouldering session and then a long hangboard session all together. It's just too much. So in that case, you should maybe do, you know, one set of each grip position. Or if you're going to do three sets of a weak position, like open hand if you're weak, 
do three sets on that and then, you know, nothing else. Again, so much of this, you know, it's hard to give specific answers because uh, we are all different in terms of our, you know, our climbing history, our loading history, uh, our training experience, uh, you know, just kind of what level we're at. And so that's really where you need to learn to self-coach effectively or if you have access to a veteran coach that can work with you in person and really, you know, create a program for you, a very comprehensive program. And, you know, when I work with a, a pro level climber, that's what I'm trying to do is really get inside their day to day schedule and piece together the right program that uh, fits their needs and gives them the right amount of training stimulus and no more. Uh, because any more than what is needed just digs a deeper hole to recover from. Uh, and, you know, it's extra wear and tear in the connective tissues, which, um, you know, is something that happens unknowingly to us that we fall behind in terms of connective tissue remodeling. And that's where those acute injuries come about, like a finger pulley injury that just happens. You think it just happened that day, but it was brewing over a period of time. Um, and there was that move that was the straw that broke the camel's back. But that low grade, um, below the nociceptor threshold uh, injury was actually building over a period of days, weeks, perhaps months from uh, too much training and climbing and too little resting and maybe too little protein as well. Okay, a few more questions here and then we will wrap things up. Um, he says, uh, when in rehab mode, is it best to do two rehab sessions a day, both split between six hours and consuming collagen? Uh, was hanging with your son Cameron at the crag the other day, great guy. Well, thank you. Yeah, Cam just turned 22. Uh, a few days ago, and uh, I uh, appreciate the kind words. I think he's a good young man, pretty strong climber. Um, both my sons are, uh, you know, Jonathan being my younger son, uh, nine, age 19. But uh, your question is an excellent one, and uh, rehab uh, very often can be done twice a day and is better to be done twice a day, and here's why. Uh, assuming especially connective tissue rehab, which is what we're often dealing with uh, you know, when it comes to a, an achy, injured athlete. Uh, those, uh, I mentioned earlier in this episode, the metabolically active cells, and there's not a lot of them, but there are some metabolically active cells in your connective tissues. Uh, those tenocytes uh, get turned on from loading, and then they can extrude collagen, and with proper loading, they get a signal to align the collagen, all is well. Here's a problem. Those tenocytes get turned off from too much loading. So it's kind of like, um, you know, if you're yelling at your kids, a little bit of yelling might be a good thing to get their attention and get a point across. But if you're yelling at them constantly, like all day long, they shut you off. That's how those tenocytes are in your connective tissues they get turned on from loading, but too much loading, too long of a session, they turn themselves off. And then you don't get the benefit of that session. And so that's why I am a big fan for like elite climbers to, instead of doing a long four hour workout, you do a morning workout, you do an evening workout, you know, the two a days. That's what I just did this weekend. That long four hour session, that long all day climbing, you know, the, the, the tenocytes got turned on at the beginning, but they actually got turned off because it became so excessive. And that, that can lead you down this path of overtraining and injury. Well, when it comes to rehab, it only takes, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of some basic rehab. If you're targeting just one body part, it doesn't take a lot to turn them on. Uh, and what you don't want to do is turn them off. So you do that brief rehab session in the morning, and then six, eight, 10 hours later, you do another brief rehab session. Uh, and it, it, let's say you're rehabbing a finger pulley. Again, it's gotta be very appropriate loading. It can't be anything crazy. But let's say you're doing some lifting exercises with your injured finger, uh, or you're doing some shoulder training for your injured shoulder. Uh, do a session in the morning at six, seven, eight a.m. 
uh, and do another session later in the day. Uh, and there's this refractory period where you know the tenocytes reset. So uh, it's a, you flush your toilet and then there's this refractory period until it gets reset and you can flush it again. And so with connective tissues, you know, six, eight hours is what the research seems to show that refractory period is. And so if you're gonna do two sessions, you want them at least six or eight hours apart so that like the toilet getting reset to flush again, the tenocytes get reset to be signaled and turned on again. Uh, and so that's, that's the, uh, uh, you know, the amazing data that we've gotten from, uh, you know, a couple of researchers, uh, you know, like Keith Barr at UC Davis. Um, and I think it's um, Greg, is it Wells in Australia, uh, Sports Institute that have done these studies and uh, really helped us refine our protocols for rehabbing uh, connective tissue injuries. So two short sessions better than one long session, no doubt. Um, and you mentioned the collagen. Yes, you know, uh, supercharged collagen by Fizzy Vantage, you know, we designed it according to those researcher protocols. And you wanna consume that 30 to 60 minutes before you do your loading or your rehab. And it provides a flood of the collagen specific amino acids into your bloodstream that the tenocytes need those amino acids, especially glycine, proline, and hydroxyproline uh, to extrude, you know, to make uh, collagen, you know, to help the collagen remodel. If you are protein deficient, and if you're not getting enough of those collagen specific amino acids, well then you can turn the tenocytes on, but it's kind of like turning on a car engine or trying to turn on a car engine without any gas in the tank. It's not gonna get you very far. So protein is the other side of the coin. The loading is the signal for remodeling and the protein is the substrate. You know, it's the bricks to build, you know, the wall. Uh, okay, hopefully that all made sense. Um, and I guess we'll do one last question here and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Uh, this is from Autumn. Um, uh, she says, I assume it's a she, uh, I am new to climbing. I just started under a year ago and I only climb with guys, so it's hard to keep up. So, uh, uh, and she says, I've climbed 512. What training tips do you suggest to, to progress further? Well, um, I'm sure it sounds like you're hanging with the guys there, uh, Autumn. And uh, 512 in one year is amazing. So, you know, you got some talent there uh, for sure. Um, you know, and uh, so that's all good. And, you know, climbing with people that are better than you is a nice thing, you know, that helps elevate your game, but it can also be frustrating and it can, you know, perhaps uh, in some cases get people injured because they try to train like those more experienced, you know, stronger climbers do. Uh, and so you have to have that kind of discipline to, um, you know, self-regulate on any given day what you're doing and not just do exactly what these other climbers, I mean, that's a rule for all climbers to apply is, you know, if you blindly follow and do what other people do, um, maybe bits and pieces of it could be appropriate, but there's certainly going to be portions of it that aren't and that could tempt injury or just not be the right training for you. And so, you know, again, it sounds like the fact you're watching the training cafe means you're very interested and curious about learning about training for climbing. Um, check out my book, Training for Climbing, listen to the Training for Climbing podcast, and certainly there's a lot of other good resources out there as well that you can tap into and load up on information. But I warn you, and to any listener, there's just this flood of information on Training for Climbing. You know, you go to Instagram and everybody's exercising now, and, uh, you know, and everybody has advice, and there's some really good advice out there, and there's some really bad advice out there. Um, and, you know, to, you know, there are no absolutes when it comes to training for climbing. You know, when I answer questions of climbers, I use the phrase, it depends a lot because there are so many variables at play. For a young climber like you to kind of get to answering your question, remember that climbing is very technical, it's very mental, and obviously it's very physical, but all three of those things, things you need to work on at the same time. Uh, and, you know, some beginners get sidetracked and jump into physical training too quickly um, and it can compromise their technique and it can get them injured if they jump into, say, hangboard or campus training too quickly. Um, you know, the first year or two, you should mostly just be climbing two, three, four days a week 
because you need to learn the skills. Um, and the more variety you can learn uh, of climbing skills, getting on walls of different angle, holds of different size. Um, you know, a lot of, most climbers today get into the sport through the climbing gym and they might become enamored of bouldering and only boulder. And it's, you know, getting on a route is a very different thing physically, mentally, technically because it, it, it demands more efficiency, more mental control, obviously more physical endurance. Um, and so I, I think people who boulder exclusively should get on a rope and people who rope climb most of the time should probably boulder more. Um, and then getting outside is another thing that adds a lot more novelty and variety to your training because you know, the indoors have limitations, you know, in terms of shapes and sizes of holds. You go outdoors and it's an infinite playing field. Uh, and so all of those things, um, you know, remain curious, autumn and passionate. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you'll do well hanging with the guys, but uh, find your own path in climbing. And I think it would be good if you can find a female partner to climb with on occasion too, that can be a really rewarding thing too, as can climbing with the guys, you know, and I have no doubt, uh, you know, um, you will continue to improve quickly and, you know, maybe you'll be crushing some of those, <laughs> some of those folks uh, very, very soon. So um, hopefully uh, we covered some good territory here in the last, uh, what, 45 or so minutes. And I think it's soon time here to close up shop on the training cafe. If you still have your cup of coffee, let's sip together one more time. In the spirit of climbing, what's better than climbing coffee and talking about training? That's what the training cafe is all about. So I guess it's time to sign off and uh, I'll probably try to do one of these again in two weeks. That's my goal is every other Monday, though sometimes that schedule doesn't quite work out, but uh, tune back in and uh, tell a friend about the Training Cafe. Do check out the Training for Climbing podcast. Uh, though I'm not there a lot, Twitter, uh, train, at train, the, the number four, climbing. Uh, if you're a Twitter person, that is my, uh, my Twitter handle, and I am a little more active on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram. Uh, though I'm not someone that, uh, you know, spends all day with the phone in my hand. So it's not good to ask me questions there because I may not ever see them. <laughs> so I'm not ignoring you. It's just that I literally may not ever see your message. So, uh, but uh, hopefully I'll see you at the Crags. Um, and uh, if not, see you hopefully in two weeks at the Training Cafe. Bye-bye.